Okay, well, I've been asked to um, thank you very much for inviting me to the meeting. Um, uh, Rohit worked with us last year, and I've since met Rohit in, uh, in India recently. I'm not quite sure when I'll get back there again, the way things are. But I've been asked to talk about um, revision hip arthroplasty, looking at uh, the acetabular side. And I'd echo Rami's words in that when I started in practice, I, I was working with two senior surgeons who started doing hip replacement in the 60s. And so managed to inherit a lot of problems. And um, things have certainly changed over the last 20 years. And we've, and we've learned a lot in, um, in the quality and durability of results, what can be achieved. And in difficulty, uh, the difficulty of the, the problems that can be managed, but we're seeing far, far fewer of them. So the essentials for success are to have pre-op planning, and that includes having a plan B. And by, by I mean having a plan B is, is predicting what possibly could go wrong. So you have in the hospital available to you alternate implants for usage, bone grafting, cables, all the things that you'll need to bail you out if things haven't gone as you've planned. You need an extensile exposure. And um, I also predominantly use the, uh, the, the posterior approach. I only use the anterior approach if I was going to adjust a cup position for something like dislocation or early failure in, um, in patients who previously had um, a anterior approach. You will save efficient implant removal. And then you want du durable implant fixation, managing the bone loss, and thinking about the bearing, because one of the biggest complications in revision surgery is dislocation. So preoperative planning includes x-rays, uh, CT scan where there's bone loss. Um, you want to work up for infection. Dr. Bagari has covered that in detail, so I won't go into that. In the preoperative planning, you're assessing the bone loss. And to state the obvious, the larger the bone defect, the more complex the problem. And the more difficult it's going to be uh, to, to be confident you're going to achieve a, uh, a satisfactory outcome. The most critical part of the bone in the acetabulum is the posterior superior bone, because what you're trying to do is get superior support for your new implants. And if you've got compromised posterior column bone, it's going to be difficult. So good extensile exposure, posterior approaching extend as far as you want to. You can mobilize and get the femur out of the way to expose the acetabulum. Uh, and it facilitates the surgery, it preserves the bone stock, and obviously you're not compromising the, the abductors. So careful implant removal minimizes further bone loss and avoid fracture. And although you may have had a preoperative assessment of what the bone deficiency is, if you've caused more damage taking the existing implants out, that classification has changed. We're fortunate that since uh, moving to uncemented implants is the predominant choice of most surgeons. It's now the more common cause for vision. Previously, the, there was a very high failure rate with um, cemented acetabular implants at around 10 to 14 years. We don't see that so much these days. We see failure with osteolysis or recurrent dislocation or just overall uh, failure um, from, uh, from aseptic loosening. And it used to be very difficult to get the implant out of the acetabulum without damaging the anterior column or the posterior column. But with these new explants, uh, you can get it out usually with very minimal bone loss, even with pegged implants or implants with, with um, screw in mechanisms. The next, the next thing is, is do you want to achieve durable implant uh, fixation? And this is a patient who'd had a, um, a failed ASR. You can see there's osteolysis across the pubis there with a, a, a fracture. But fortunately with the ASR, they're quite easy to remove and usually with minimal bone loss other than what was as a result of osteolysis and it's very amenable to a hemispherical uh, uncemented implant for fixation. So the lessons we've learned in the past, um, uh, even with the best cement techniques in the femur, the loosening rates are at least 20% by, by 10 years and the acetabular loosening rates are even greater. So there's been a, 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 a that technique's largely been abandoned, except when uh, impaction grafting, which did show some good results in, in category, up to category 3A for uh, revision. But that, that technique is, is not commonly used these days as uncemented implants do appear to have a much better chance of survival. Uncemented implants improve the fixation compared to cement revision, and it's enduring. If you can get good stable fixation from the beginning, the bone will regenerate and attach the metal, 
And if you've got biological fixation, it will be enduring. So multiple series demonstrate that hemispherical sockets provide good and enduring fixation and revision for loosening is probably less than 5% at five to 12 years with variability, variation among different series. And in my practice now, I would say that you can address over 90% of your revisions with just a hemispherical cup. So the principle is to gain biological fixation, you chase the good bone. So you want your implant up against 50%, hopefully, of host bone, which has got to be viable host bone. And if you can get a stable situation that, in that uh, arrangement, your, your likelihood of success is, is very good. So you need a larger cup and aiming for 50% host bone contact. And if you are adding uh, particulate bone graft, you've got to be careful that the particulate bone graft does not come in between the host bone where you're trying to get contact and you're just using it to fill the defects. So to get the acetabulum exposure, you want a circumferential exposure, you want to see the, the rim all the way around, remove the, the membrane and cement, and it involves very gentle ream just to recreate a hemisphere without, um, without compromising the anterior or the posterior column or rim. Generally, when patients have loosening, they tend to get um, uh, a bigger diameter of the defect in a superior inferior direction as opposed to an anterior to posterior uh, direction. And if you're using a hemispherical cup, you're limited to the size of what the cup will accommodate from the anterior to posterior dimension. So to ensure rigid initial fixation, you need to have good superior bone support. If you can't get good superior bone support, the chance of it, of it surviving is poor. And you, need, and you also need to achieve sufficient host bone contact for biological incorporation, and you need viable host bone. So if the patient's had radiotherapy and the bone's not in good condition, you, uh, just a hemispherical cup is probably not gonna do the trick. Now, if you, if you can't meet those criteria above, you need to move to other options. The common areas in using a, hemisphe in a hemispherical cup is to undersize the implant. Generally, you want to, um, before you put the implant in, depending on what, it, what the REMA to um, specifications of the true diameter of the implant is, you want to be between two and four millimetres oversizing from the REMA. You, it's important to avoid over-reaming the posterior wall where most of your support is going to come from. And sometimes you can fail to recognise a fracture or discontinuity. And if that's the case, the hemispherical cup's going to fail. So unsemented hemispherical cups have their limitations. If there's significant bone deficiency, if you've got inadequate host bone contact, and if you're not able to, unable to main, maintain a stable construct. So we'll just look at the classifications, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The Proposky classification is based on four variables. The location or migration of the hip center in, re in uh, reference to the superior obturator line, whether it's in the true position, it's, it's migrated superior by less than three centimeters or greater than three centimeters. The degree of teardrop destruction, the amount of issue osteolysis and the integrity of uh, Kohler's line. And you can see those, um, uh, you see that most people are familiar with the anatomy, the teardrop, the movement above the um, inferior teardrop uh, tran transverse line, Kohler's line, which would determine the integrity of the medial wall and how much uh, osteolysis of the ischium, which will give some, influence, some indication of what's happening to the posterior wall. But obviously in these situations, you're also gonna get a CT scan, to get a clear definition of how much bone loss there actually is. Kohler's line. So Proposky's classification type one, has it got an acetabular rim and everything intact, basically a straightforward revision. Generally with a type 2A and 2B, they're fairly straightforward revisions. revisions. You can normally get away with just using a hemispherical cup. If you've got isolated medial migration, uh, if you've got a good, a good rim, generally you'll still be able to maintain just with a hemispherical cup. If, if the rim's compromised, then you may need to go to, to a, uh, some sort of cage device. The difficult ones are really the 3A and the 3Bs. 3As are generally managed uh, in a number of ways with success. The real problem is the 3Bs where you cannot get superior 
uh, good superior support for the for the acetabular construct, or if you've got pelvic con discontinuity. Is the uh, AAOS classification? You've got a segmental defect. Whether you've got a cavitatory defect. Whether you've got a combined defect or type four uh, discontinuity. And type five if you've got an arthrodesis. So the bone loss may be addressed with structural or particulate graft, uh, modular porous metal augments, structural allograft, a cage, a cup cage construct, or a custom triflange device. So this, this is a, an old case I did probably almost 20 years ago, and uh, this patient had had a total hip replacement and had the, a high cup put in, which had loosened, and that's having a warning. And in this situation, we didn't have we didn't have uh, uh, good alternatives, uh, so we used a structural allograft. And um, it, I think this case only really worked because there's actually more bone inferiorly support superiorly supporting the cup in the new true position that that held it and allowed the the uh, implant to engrow. Generally, structural allograft will not be successful in a 3B, but it can be successful in a th type 3A. Oblong cups have been used. And if, if the defect is, uh, is, is contained in a 3A, and you can get a good anatomic match between the oblong cup and the, uh, and the defect, the chance of success are good. However, these, these cups have largely gone out of favour as people have moved to using um, trabecular metal uh, augments and uh, hemispherical cups. But it comes down to the same principle. If you get rigid fixation first time around, the chance of it working is high. So trabecular metal augments and hemispherical cups, these give you more flexibility to get host bone contact. The, one, the first one there is, um, it's got a petrusio cage, which, which is uh, a trabecular metal as well. So it's got potential for bone on growth. And in the other one, this is a patient from over, over 12, 15 years ago, who had a failed um, multiple procedures from a post-traumatic acetabular fracture, uh, trauma from acetabular fracture. And we tried to fix this using stacked augments and a hemispherical cup, and it lasted for a while, but I'll show you what happened to it a bit further on. And generally, again, these three B situation uh, cups failures are the hardest ones to manage. Now, impaction grafting and uh, cemented cup, this is technique which is more, more successful in the, the type twos, the type three A rather than type three B. But this case is from many, many years ago in an elderly patient and using mesh and impaction grafting, uh, the, it, it can be successful over time. Often they later fail, but some of the results out of um, series published um, in, three, in type three A show good survivorship at five years of, with a revision rate of only around uh, seven or seven to ten percent. Uh, I think this technique shouldn't be abandoned entirely, uh, particularly if you don't have access to the more more expensive implants. You can use impaction grafting and cementing, particularly if it's contained. But the technique you need to be careful with the technique and get good solid a bone of a better bone before you cement the cup in. Impaction grafting in a cage. Uh, these do work for a while. The problem with these older cages are the, the Gantz and the Burke Schneider is they, they were not strong cages. They didn't have any biological on growth. And so eventually if the bone resorbed, they would fail. But in an older patient, that is an option. Since they've moved to biological devices, which you get on growth, the chance of success is greater. This is a case from not long ago, a patient had a, um, uh, uh, anterior approach to total hip in a very early patient. Um, unfortunately, the cup was punched right through. And in this case, we're allowed to use a biological fixation cage with a structural allograft and the patient, despite the degree of osteopenia, has managed to do well at three years. So if you've got pelvic discontinuity, uh, really the best option is to go for a custom triflange component. With that, you can restore the hip center, you get rigid fixation to the ilium, ischium, and pubis. You can maximize host bone contact, uh, so you get on growth. The downside is expensive, but in some cases the expense is, is well 
is well balanced by the fact that if you try other techniques and have multiple failures, the accumulation of those surgeries cancels out any benefit of, uh, of trying to save money from the first time around. It's an example of a, of a failed Burke Schneider cage with a 3B defect. And with the custom implant, you're going to get good fixation superiorly. So you've got a good stable construct. You've got this, it's important that the screws are oriented and this is all done properly on scanning. They're oriented, they're non-parallel so that the construct, and they're all, uh, they're all fixed screws. Once you've got a stable fixation there, the chance of on growing is very good. It's a patient with 3A. We don't, wouldn't normally need to use a, um, a custom in a 3A defect, but this patient had had previous high dose radiotherapy and had osteon osteonecrosis of much of the pelvis. So the aim was to give as wide a fixation as possible. Uh, and the best way to do that was to, to, to use a, a custom device. This was this patient I showed you earlier who'd had the stacked augments, who had eight, I think it was about eight years post-surgery, it failed. It's got big defects as a result of that. He's got a, a no, there's no pelvic discontinuity, but he does have um, uh, a, quite a, a, a bad or advanced uh, type 3B situation. So with the planning, you can predict where the screws can go, how much fixation you can get, looking for where the good bone is to try and get good host bone contact from the cage. And you can see the result there that uh, the patient is now, he's, back, he's a pest inspector, he's back at work crawling under houses, and he's got no trochanteric attachment, but he's got a stable arrangement, which brings you onto the next issue is looking at um, the bearing. So in most series, the risk was up to 10%. Uh, it's important to restore leg length and offset. If you do that, you're halfway there. Uh, if the patient's got a Charmley stem in, they've got a 22 millimeter head and you put in a 60 cup, your chance of dislocation goes up high. So you want to avoid a large cup to head size differential. And these days I would generally use a dual mobility in these more complex revisions. I haven't used constrained liners very often, but if they have no abductor function, that is obviously a consideration as well. So the essentials for success, safe, efficient implant removal, durable implant fixation, effective bone loss management, and a stable bearing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.